Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is enjoying their breakfast while listening to the talk. Okay. Um, let me set out the stage for the first half of the talk for the day. We have two speakers today. I'm going to moderate for the sessions for Dr. Aidas. I have Dr. Ken here from Psychological Medicine Department. So there are times that we see many patients in different kinds of wards, medical wards, BD surgical wards, ONG or ENT. We are busy dealing with looking out for the causes of the illness, risk factors and different modalities of treatment, for example. But there are times that we can do something more actually, especially in those probably challenging for some and probably might not be so challenging for some. For those patients might be crying or in distress, suffering from the illness. What else can we do for them? Do we refer psychiatry? Do we talk to them? Do we listen to them? Today, we are welcome and honored to have Dr. Aidas Sharinas from our own University Malaya Department, Psychological Medicine Department, to have talked about some of the ideas and shed some light regarding this instance. Dr. Aida graduated from University Malaya, homebred, undergrad and postgrad in here, UM itself. And also she has a specialty in psychodynamic psychotherapy. And she's also having years of experience in the consultation liaison psychiatry, which is one of the subspecialty. For those who might not be so familiar with the term of liaison psychiatry, it's a subspecialty who deals with patients who are having probably some concurrent medical or physical illnesses at the same time, having psychological or psychiatric difficulties. So Tata Aidas is the specialist in this niche of field. She'll be the best person to speak with regarding these instances whereby how do we deal with this patient in different kind of wards having this kind of distress. Let us welcome Dr. Aida Sharinas. I'll pass the mic to you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ken, for the kind introduction. Okay, um, let me try and share the slide, yeah? So, um, topic of the breakfast talk today is crying patients, empathy or psychiatry. So what do I mean by this? Uh, when we see patients, okay, when they are diagnosed with certain medical conditions or surgical conditions, uh, sometimes patients tend to cry. So uh, the question is whether do you need to straight away refer to psychiatry or perhaps you can provide some kind of empathy to listen to the patient's concern. So in this consultation, psychiatric, consultation liaison psychiatric unit, it is headed by Prof. Ng Chong Guan, um, and also run by uh, two specialists, which is uh, myself and also Dr. Amar Preet. And in this team, we also have counselors and psychologists to assist us in seeing patients. As how Dr. Ken has mentioned earlier, consultation based on psychiatry involves um, cases which uh, probably psychiatric in nature, and then they develop medical or surgical complications or vice versa when patients from other wards, uh, for example, from the medical ward or surgical ward, due to their medical conditions, they develop psychiatric complications. As you can see in this uh, flower, some of the th uh, kind of patients that we see are patients with neurological illness that has psychiatric manifestation. So for example, multiple sclerosis. Patients with neurological illness masquerading as psychiatric illness, such as uh, complex partial seizures. Patients with psychiatric condition, but presenting with medical uh, manifestations, such as somatic symptom disorder, psychological non-epileptic seizure, conversion disorder, okay? And patients uh, with treatment of psychiatric conditions that's causing them to have medical illness. So for example, our patients um, with, on antipsychotics, they tend to develop metabolic syndrome. We also see patients 
who have psychiatric conditions but at risk for developing medical illness. So, for example, depressed patients has a higher risk for developing cardiovascular diseases or diabetes. Uh, other kind of patients that we see are patients with psychiatric disorders that, that cause medical illness. So, for example, patients who are having anxiety, they might develop uh, conditions like cardiovascular diseases. Uh, we also see patients who are on treatment, for example, on interferon uh, treatment, and they develop uh, psychiatric manifestation. Right. At, uh, recently, we also see different kinds of patients requiring organ transplant, and they asked uh, our team to assess for fitness to give consent. Uh, these are the kind of cases that we see in consultation liaison. Okay. So recently, we did a audit. We did an audit for the psychiatric liaison team. In UMMC, the definition of liaison psychiatric service involves inpatient catering to adults ranging from 18 years old to 60 years old, and they're awarded to the non psychiatric inpatient services in UMMC. So this excludes patient population from the pediatric groups or the geriatric groups. Uh, we also exclude the patients with substance usage. These would be referred to the child adolescent unit, the psychogeriatric unit, or our substance use disorder team. So based on our result from the audit that we uh, did, we found an interesting finding that I'd like to highlight today. So the aim and objectives of the uh, audit was to identify the strengths and weaknesses of inpatient liaison psychiatric services as a prerequisite to improve the services that can be provided. So the primary objective was to study the referral trends of inpatient liaison psychiatric services by comparing the caseloads from three distinct periods, namely the pre-pandemic, the during pandemic, and also post-pandemic. And the second objective was to audit the shortcomings of our census recording. So in our unit, we have a book recording details of our referrals from January 2019 to December 2021. There was a total of 873 cases referred to us within the 36 months period. So the common reasons for referrals include to rule out depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, or when patient manifests changes in behavior. So this sometimes occur as uh, patients having hallucinations, delusions, they have aggressive behavior, or they're simply uncooperative with the healthcare uh, professional's suggestion and treatment. So this is the finding from our audit. Uh, we have group of diagnosis and the frequencies of the cases referred. So these patients, we try our best to see the patient on the same day that we receive the referrals, especially those emergency cases. So in psychiatric terms, emergency means uh, the patients are at risk of harming themselves or harming others. So this table shows that one third of the patients that we receive referrals from actually have normal psychological reaction. And this is followed by adjustment disorder, psychotic disorder, and mood disorders, okay? So what is normal psychological reaction? It is an individual's response to a stressful situation that falls within expectation and it is socially acceptable. Okay, So some of the common issues that leads to distress for the inpatients that we saw was their lack of knowledge and understanding of their illnesses, having financial difficulties related to the treatment of their illnesses, prolonged admission with no clear goals of treatment, and communication breakdown between patients and clinician. So from the audit, um, the suggestions that we made was 
to enhance the understanding of major psychiatric illnesses versus normal psychological reaction. Because the higher representation of normal psychological reaction and adjustment disorders amongst all case referrals suggests the need to equip non-psychiatric clinicians with certain skills to enhance patient care and alleviate most of their distress. So these skills include effect, effective communication skills, psychological counseling skills, and accessibility to mobilize resources. So due to this, this is why I chose the topic so that perhaps um, we can improve the communication skills. Now let's talk about emotions or feelings, okay? Uh, let me give you an example, everyday example. So let's say if I'm walking and I'm suddenly being chased by a fierce looking dog with sharp teeth, so how would I feel? I'll definitely feel scared because my body would associate that it might hurt me and I might lose my life, okay? What happens if I'm driving and some driver cut queue? So it's natural that I will feel angry. What about if my friend surprised me with a lovely gift? So I'll definitely feel happy. Okay, so as humans, we can't run away from emotions. We are usually okay with pleasant emotions, but we do get very uncomfortable with the unpleasant ones. So these are some of the normal reactions to stress. Okay. Maybe to put it, uh, to make it easier, imagine yourself when you were diagnosed with COVID earlier or when you were going through dengue fever or when you had that ACL tear, how do you feel? So we might feel resentful, we might feel angry, disappointed, we might feel scared, frustrated, we might feel hopeless, we'll definitely feel sad, and we'll feel anxious. So how do we differentiate between normal sadness and depression? So depression here, I mean major depressive disorder, okay? So sadness is a typical human emotion that has varying degrees, okay? But unlike depression, it is temporary and it fades with time. However, if you have major depressive disorder, you'll have persistent low mood uh, at least for two weeks. You'll have anhedonia, which is loss of interest in anything that was pleasurable. You might have excessive overthinking, frustration, hopelessness, worthlessness. You'll easily feel irritable. There's excessive amount of guilt. You have some cognitive impairment whereby your concentration and focus will, uh, will be affected. You feel very, very tired. You have body ache. There will be some changes in your sleep and eating habits as well. And once someone feels very hopeless and worthless, the thought of harming themselves or end their life might come in. There's also this... Um, disorder that's called adjustment disorder. So what is the difference between adjustment disorder versus depression? So for adjustment disorder, there is a clear identifiable stressor and it is followed with marked distress. Okay? And as opposed to depression, there might not be a clearly identifiable stressor, although stressors like being diagnosed with something can be a precipitating factor. For adjustment disorder, it is usually shorter in duration, doesn't go more than six months. But for depression, it may manifest within weeks or years. Now, what about our duty as a doctor? I'd like to talk a bit on clinical empathy. What does it mean? It means distilling or connecting of feelings and meanings that are associated with a patient's experience while simultaneously identifying, isolating, and withholding one's own reaction. So to simply put, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person emotionally. And this is an important part of any doctor-patient relationship because its expression creates an alliance between you and the patient to assure that you care about them. It is very important to develop 
Therapeutic Alliance. So there's this study that I found by an author, Aun et al. Uh, it is a Lebanese study on how do Lebanese patients perceive the ideal doctors uh, basing on the uh, CANMAT's competency framework. So as you can see here, most patients wants us to be a good communicator. They want us to be compassion. They want us to listen. They want us to explain things to them. So let me give you an example of how expressing empathy looks like. So this is a response from a doctor, okay? When a patient who has URTI symptoms and she wants to be treated with antibiotics straight away. So it sounds like you feel terrible. There are some awful viruses going around and it looks like you've caught one of them. Unfortunately, antibiotics aren't going to work here. I would give you an antibiotic if I thought it would be anything, it would do anything other than give you stomach ache or diarrhea. Being ill is so frustrating, I know, but I have some ideas that could be helpful and may reduce your symptoms while we wait for the viruses to clear. So this is the first answer or ex uh, expression of empathy. Now let's look at the other one. You have a virus, antibiotics don't cure viruses. We can't give out antibiotics unless we know it's a bacterial infection because unneeded antibiotics contribute to resistance and other physical problems. You can take the congestion and anti-inflammatory and you should get some rest while you, while you wait it out. Can you see the difference between the two? So the first one acknowledges and validates the patient's discomfort, while the second one is expressed more robotically. Expressing empathy will do more to build trust with the patient, even if they are frustrated. And what's more, without empathy, the patient may leave angry, still convinced that they need an antibiotic because they don't think you listen when they were saying how bad they felt. So as a doctor, as a healthcare professionals, what can we do? In the physician-patient relationship, communication is vital. Okay? And expert knowledge and emotion is central. So how do we deal with this? There is a mnemonic that I'd like you to consider. A, B, C, D, E. So A is for advanced preparation. B, build therapeutic relationship. C, communicate well. D, dealing with patient and family reaction. And E, encourage or validate the patient's emotion. So these are some of tips on how to deal with crying patients. First one, allow the patient a few moments to cry. Then, instead of looking directly at the patient, look slightly down. This allows the patient some respectful space for their peers. Take note of your own body language. Okay? If you're uncomfortable with the emotion, we often, uh, we are very, naturally we are very uncomfortable with emotions, okay? The muscles in our body will start to tense. So by noticing this, you try to relax your body. If you notice that your breathing is shallow, take a couple of full breaths, keep an open body posture, uncross your arms and leg, and breathe deeply. Third, you can place a box of tissue within arm's reach of the patient. This will allow the patient the choice of using a tissue. Placing the box nearby instead of handling loose tissue is often interpreted as a supportive gesture rather than relaying a message that you'd like the patient to stop crying. Number four, respond verbally. One way to respond is to use uh, two simple statements and a question. So statement of empathy would include, this is really difficult, or I'm sorry, this is upsetting. And then you can give a statement of validation. For example, this is a challenging situation for many patients. Or you can even say, you have every reason to be upset. And then followed by a question about their needs. For example, how can I help? Or do you need a moment? Is there any more information I could provide? And after this, you can follow up with support information. 
understanding the patient's uh, needs, you can provide them with a list of appropriate resources, including support groups, quality informational websites, online communities, etc. So why am I highlighting this again? To answer, my, to answer the question, crying patients, is it empathy or psychiatry? It can actually be both. Differentiating the normal reaction in pathological anxiety or depres uh, depression can be difficult at times. So we as doctors, we got to learn to be okay with not okay because having emotion is part of being human. Dealing with crying patient is uncomfortable, but it will get better with practice. So my tip is when you see a crying patient, give some time for them to react. However, if it is persistent, it is worsening, and it's starting to interrupt with the treatment plans, and they have thoughts of worthlessness, and they start thinking of harming themselves, this definitely warrants a psychiatric review. With that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aida, for the enlightening talk and sharing some of her valuable experience on how to deal with crying or distressed patient in the many different kinds of wards. So from the talk that we have listened from Dr. Aida, um, probably there might be some moments the patient might be crying, difficult, with their emotions, that may be normal stress reaction up to 30% of the time. Yes, 70% of the time that might warrant a psychiatric referral. But during this 30% of the time or many other instances that we can do something more than just doctors, maybe as fellow homo sapiens, human beings, we can at least listen to them with empathy and try to validate their emotions, saying some kind words to them. And most of the time, they will solve half of the problem. If it doesn't do, refer to us. Okay. <laughs> Any questions from the floor? You can either uh, post in the chat box, I guess. Mm -mm. If you are unable to speak, I'm not too sure if you are able to speak through the mic or not. If there's any question, shall we proceed to the second session? Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Aida and the audience. Dr. Ken. Okay.